We're finishing up our week with a series called God's at War. We've been talking about some, some very easy topics over the past few weeks. Uh, we've talked about sexual immorality. We've talked about pride. We've talked about idols. We've talked about some things that we are at a war with that enemy that is looking to see, kill, and destroy. The problem is, is I think when you're in a war and you don't know you're in a war, you, you usually don't win. And so we've been looking at some areas within our own lives, within our own church that we fight on a day in, day out basis. We've used a couple of verses throughout this series. Here's the one that, that tells us the war we're in is found in Ephesians 6, 12. It says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We are fighting a, a, against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits. In the heavenly places, there's a war going on for our souls, and we don't even see it, but it's happening. We do see it in our schools. We see it through the evil that's, that's running rampant within our, our nation right now. We see it through the hate. We see it through the, through the news. There is a war going on, and it's for the souls of each and every person, not just our own personal souls, but the battle affects generations to come. We're, we've landed here with God's uh, commandment in Exodus 21 through 3, it says, Then God gave the people all these instructions. He said, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. And then he says this, You must not have any other gods but me. He is a jealous God. He created us to have relationship with him he created us to to be in community with each other and with him we've got to get the vertical right along with the horizontal right that, that there is so much within those 10 commandments it's not just a, a list of do's and don'ts but it's actually uh god gave us those because he knew the pain that would come if we ever got off kilter and i think having no other gods before me is a big deal right now in our society in our schools at our workplaces all across our nation today i have titled this the enemy within we're going to talk about a battle that is raging and it's not out there we're going to talk about and, and this may get a little bit uh, squirrely for some of you. I know that that when you start talking about church stuff, if you're a guest here this morning, if you're not a Christ follower here this morning, welcome. You are in a safe place. We love the fact that you're you're taking some steps to get some answers. We are totally available and not at all intimidated by those questions. We love the fact you're here. But this kind of message has the possibility of stepping on some toes within the church world the battle within our own church and i don't necessarily mean this church if, if i step on your toes today i promise i don't sit around during the week and go mm, who can i carve my message around that's not living right because i would have to carve messages around me I, I, I worked this out about a month or two ago, and, and I'll tell you, if your toes are stomped on, I always say this, if your toes are stepped on, they probably shouldn't be in the road that we're traveling down, right? My toes are stomped on during this whole entire message because these are all things, when we talk about things that we put above God, when we talk about spiritual pride, when we talk about sexual immorality and, and, and the, the, the level that God raised it to, I go, man be brutal but i want to talk today about the enemy within the enemy who wants to get inside our churches and, and who wants to split us because if the enemy can keep us fighting ourselves and by ourselves i mean the church the big church the, the if the enemy can keep us fighting amongst ourselves it makes us ineffective in the war it makes us ineffective in the war i'm going to tell you a little bit of of, of my story on and i think for some of you if you've come within the past year i know there's always this like what is he doing or or why does he do things the way that he does like many of y'all this morning have asked me about this gas can <laughs> we have a security team by the way which is phenomenal and I want to thank them every day. I stand up here when I see the craziness going on in the world. I know that we have, have men that are, that are guarding our service. And, and I want to say thank you to those guys. But all 50 of them this morning have come up and asked me about this gas can because it makes them very nervous. And, and I even had one take it outside and smell it. And then I've had others ask me, is it a new gas can or an old gas can? 
Um, something about a gas can by a candle seems to make y'all nervous. I wonder why. I get it. We're going to use that later. Uh, <laughs> that made you even more nervous. But the truth of it is, 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 is we live in a world where the crazy can happen. I walked away from church. Here's, here's part of my story and why I do things the way I do. I walked away from church about 1992. I was involved in a church that had a really bad church split. There were, there were men that at the time I was uh, uh, in the youth group, and there were some men who I massively respected. I mean, they were godly men, and, and I know that they were trying to do right stuff, but I watched as, as the church just ripped apart. And some of the guys that I had the biggest respect for, I, I heard things come out of their mouths that, that just trashed and tore down, and, and it got nasty. Some of you are in here. You've come to TWCC because you've been burned in a church. You've, you've had a, a church split or you've had a pastor who promised one thing and then turned around and, and, and had a failure in a big way. And we don't take that lightly. But I walked away from the church in, in 1992 and I stayed away for a while throughout my military career. The only time I went to church, I went to a Samoan church on Fort Benning, Georgia, because they gave out cookies. And those of you who have been in basic training, you went to the same church. I know you did because you don't get cookies. But that was the extent of my church because I said this. I said, if they're going to act like that, I don't have to get up on Sunday morning to get that. I get that every week. So I walked away and then I ran away. And then I pretty much became just this side of probably agnostic. I believed in God. And see, here's the deal. I grew up with massively Christian parents. They did their best. They taught me biblically. They, they taught me morally. They taught me, I mean, like I grew up with the, the white picket fence. We were involved in church. I was in RAs and GAs and, and choir practice until they figured out I couldn't sing. And, and then we, we had the, the Wednesday nights and the Sunday nights. If the doors were open, we were there. So I was the guy who walked away from the church, and then somewhere in the, in the early 2000s, um, I was in Branson, Missouri, and I had gotten a, an opportunity to play some baseball at a Christian college called College of the Ozarks. It's a phenomenal school. Uh, look it up. It's amazing. And uh, through that, see, when I walked onto campus, I was just this side of living on the streets. I had lived on the streets for a while. Um, I had gone down a road that I shouldn't have, and, and I wound up busted, broken, addicted, all of that. And, uh, and so that's my story, but I walked onto this campus, and I was the test case for them on how to accept a sinner into your midst. I walked in with a bunch of tattoos and piercings and, and craziness, and, and I, I got a kick out of pushing Christians' buttons to see if, if they would walk away. Because I had been burned so much by the church that I wanted to push to see if they would push back. It's, a, it's weird, but, but it's what I did. And then I walked in to this church in Missouri, and, and they didn't look at me funny. And I sat on the back row. I sat, like, in the back corner over there where Jeff's standing. Like, I stood in the back. Because if somebody was going to ask me a question or if somebody was going to say something about my tats or if somebody was going to, I was going to bolt. I was the guy that came in after worship because I don't sing, and I left before the end because I didn't want to hear the whole come to Jesus thing, right? I grew up, I knew that I'd heard every sermon frontwards and backwards. And so I was that guy, and I would push against the grain even within church, but I was working at this place called Dixie Stampede. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. They do the, you eat with your hands, and there's a horse show thing going on. It was in Branson. And, uh, and I was working my way during college, and, and there was this, this smoking hottie that walked in front of me every day as I was at work. And for some of y'all that are offended by that, that would be my wife today, which is why I said that. So, um, But she would walk, and I remember my buddy Mike and me sitting up there, and, and, and we would talk. And I was like, yeah, she's way out of it. Like, she wouldn't talk to me. She would not talk to me. I was that guy. I was still a little rough. I was kind of back in church. But uh, she wouldn't talk to me. I was running with a crew that, that we drank a lot and we fought a lot. And, I mean, they knew us. And, uh, but I was still going to church. And, uh, and so one night we were playing poker. Uh, and I feel like I can say all this. Can I say this? Are you all good with this? Uh, your pastor is a sinner, by the way, just in case you all didn't know. But I was playing poker, and I was playing with uh, Cassie's brother and a bunch of us. And, and she was actually... Uh, there to, she had came to drive uh, one of our drunk friends home, and uh, 
she went out. I'm going to tell this story. I just told her this morning I was going to tell this story, and I'm going to tell you my version of it. And so you can ask her after it's over. She'll give you her version, but mine's way more funny and accurate. So she went to drive our drunk friend home, and she had gotten a speeding ticket back in the day. And uh, uh, she had a friend who was a lawyer who was supposed to take care of it and didn't. So she had a traffic warrant out for her arrest. And so Branson, Missouri, about 2 a.m. in the morning, she is literally in pajamas and house shoes driving her drunk friend home when she rolled through a stop sign, which is why I always drive, by the way. But she rolled through a stop sign, and the police lighted her up. And so they get out, and in Branson, it doesn't look anything like here when you get pulled over and multiple cars come and attack your vehicle. But Cassie, um, I don't know what it is about our family, but uh, Branson PD, two or three cops roll up, and they handcuff her because she's got a warrant, and they arrest her. And they actually let her drunk friend follow her to the police station, <laughs> which is great. I love it. love it. love it. love it. So she gets to the police station, and she worked at Dixie. She was a waitress, but when she got ready to get out of the car, she was going to get her bail money, and she had a wad of $1 bills. She looked like a, a Colombian drug lord in pajamas. It wouldn't fit through the window, so they wouldn't let her bail herself out. So she starts calling her brother, who I was hanging out with. Long story short, she couldn't get a hold of anybody. And as she got to the bottom of the barrel, and she called me. And, uh, and so I bailed my wife out of jail. <laughs> All right? Let the record state. I bailed for her parents watching at home. I bailed your daughter out of jail. And here's the cool thing. So she gets home. She's bawling. She's crying. She's beside herself. Obviously, she'd never been arrested like the rest of us. And uh, <laughs> y'all are wondering about my background check, aren't you? Um, but uh, she gets in. She's crying, and she hugs me. I mean, this girl hardly even talked to me, right? And she's like, if there's ever anything I could do for you. And in that moment of weakness, I totally took advantage of it, and I said, you can go to lunch with me. And she was distraught, and she said, really? And I said, yeah. And she said, yeah. And I was like, awesome. And so we went to lunch, and, and then she said, hey, I go to that church that you go to. I'm part of this group. They, they get together, and they just kind of eat. And I'm like, okay. She suckered me. So I walk into this group, and there's a, uh, uh, I walk in, and there's a couple of people that their mouths dropped when I walked in. And I got that look, right? Like, what is he doing here? And the preacher was leading the group, which made it even worse because almost every preacher, with the exception of two that I've been under, has had a moral failure. So I don't like preachers. And I used to dog them a lot until I became one, and then I thought that might not be wise anymore. But the truth of it is, so I go into this group that's just supposed to eat. They had food. So... She, she was accurate, but then through that group, what I started to find was community. I started to find people who accepted me even with my past, who accepted me even with my junk, and who accepted me. It was a different way that I had seen church. Even the, the preacher was welcoming, and even the people who, after they got over their shock that I'd walked in, were welcoming. And, and we started doing life together, and to this day, they're still some of the greatest friends that we had. And see, here's the deal. I ran with the wrong crowd. I did the wrong thing. And we were doing a study on Jesus. We were actually doing this study on Jesus. And it was a defining point in my life, which this study, even way back then, has carried into the ministry that I feel like God's called me to, to lead and to guide. And it's simply this. It is found in John 1, 10 through 17. If you got your Bibles, flip there. If not, we're going to put it on the screen. Uh, we use U version a lot. There's so many translations. You can pull it up. It's a free app. It's phenomenal. But today we'll be in the NIV, which shocks some of y'all. I use all kind of translations. I believe the inspired word of God is scripture. No matter how you present it, it is his words. And it has power. Here's the deal. This is John. John's trying to describe, and, and I just try to fathom in my brain, how, how, what was it like to walk with Jesus? What was it like to see the miracles that Jesus did? What was it like to, to be a part of that? And so John's writing, and he's trying to explain Jesus. He's trying to explain the Son of God. Can you imagine trying to do that? So he's trying to explain the Son of God, and, and this was the words that he said. 
about Jesus. He says, he was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. I often wonder if Jesus walked through the church's doors today, would he be welcome? And sadly, I go in many instances, I don't know that he would because he doesn't look like us or talk like us. Or Anyway, it says, they did not receive him. Yet to all who did, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This sentence is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is salvation. This is everything rolled into one sentence. Yet to all who receive him. You know why I like this sentence so much? Because all included me at my worst. All included you at your worst. The stuff that you don't want anybody else to see or hear or know about, it includes that. It says, for all to those who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. If you've got a label, can I tell you something? When you step out in following Jesus, he changes that label from whatever it was to child of God. This is the passage that defined my life. This is the passage that defined my eternity. Because when you break this down, when you look at this verse, this is the gospel. If you believe in him, he changes your name to his child. There's so much power in that. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. You were born with a plan and a purpose. The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. God became flesh. And He made His dwelling among us. He walked and He talked with us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son. See, this isn't somebody who heard secondhand. This is somebody that walked and talked with the Messiah. He said He came in flesh. We've seen His glory. We've seen His miracles. We've seen His unconditional love who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. We'll get back to that one. John testified concerning Him, Jesus. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because He was before me. It's John the Baptist. Out of His fullness, we have received grace in place of grace already. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given. They were living under Old Testament law. But Jesus came and he said, I am the new covenant. You don't have to live by the law. We get crushed by the law. Uh, God gave us 10. Jesus gave us 2. We somehow came up with over 600. And here's the truth of it. None of us can live by that. None of us can live under the pressure of trying to get everything right. And so Jesus came and he lived among us. Full of truth and grace. And grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Salvation comes through Christ alone. Here's the thing that, that I want to tell you. Is that God can't love you any more than to send His Son. Nothing you can do is going to earn more love. Nothing you can do is going to have that love removed. Regardless of your past, regardless of your label, regardless of your sin, Jesus says, I came with full measure of truth and grace, and if you'll just believe in me and accept me, I will make you a child of mine. Imagine the love of a father who would give his son and sacrifice for us. Can you imagine that? But God said, hey, believe in him, and, and I, will, I will reserve your place in eternity with me. You know, and I think we make salvation, guys like me make salvation so hard, like you've got to come through me. If you got to come through me, the system's broken because I am the least of these. I am a sinner. There's not a pastor in this world that standing in front of God Almighty won't drop to his knees and ball. We make this so difficult, but the Bible simply says this. It says, if you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ, if you believe in him and confess him, you will be saved. You will. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to go through a pastor, a priest, a whatever. He says, if you'll just connect with him, co confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus has risen from the dead, you will be saved. Your, your name will become child of God. And I think as, as, as 
the church. We've gotten confused over this a lot. And often this verse is, is we, we, we just, it just can't be that easy. Like if God knew what I did, but yet God does know what you did. <laughs> Funny how that works. But we hide from him like Adam and Eve in the garden. Because we, we were filled with shame. But, but God says, I know, and I still love you. Like we get confused over full measure of truth and grace. And we think as a church that it ought to be 50% grace and 50% truth. And that's balance. No, that's not Jesus. Full measure. Jesus wasn't 50% grace and 50% truth. Jesus was 100% grace and 100% truth. Wow. That's difficult to wrap our brains around. It's difficult to imagine what that looks like. And I know that sometimes churches can lean heavy. It's like saying, and I hear this a lot, well, we need to be equal balance evangelism and discipleship, and, and we don't need to be 50% evangelism and 50% discipleship. We need to be 100% evangelism trying to reach every person that walks through our door. Because what saddens me is within three square miles of this building right here, there are people that are going to bust hell wide open for eternity. So until there's one that... Until there's no one left in the world that doesn't need Jesus Christ, we have to keep being 100% evangelism. But if you accept Christ and you don't grow roots and grow deeper, then when life hits, it'll blow you away like a tumbleweed. So we need to be 100% discipleship. We need to be 100% evangelism and discipleship. I was talking to a friend this week. He's talking about this guy who's over kind of over that way in town. Y'all may know him. I think he's in front of a Publix. He walks back and forth. There's a beat down trail. Back and forth, and this guy walks with a sign. And like, we make fun of people like that, right? And his sign says something to the effect of, do you know Jesus died for you? And I sit there, and it's easy for me to drop out. I mean, this cat's got a, a trail blazed back and forth. I don't know when he gets out there, but he's out there early, and he's out there late, because I've driven by both times. He's out there with a sign. And we often kind of go like, man, that guy's nuts. But then I, I, I sit there, and I think, how many people did I walk up to yesterday and just tell them, did you know Jesus died for you? Did you know that Jesus loves you? Did you know that if you just accept him, wow, eternity. This guy's out there, rain, snow, sleet, hell, it doesn't matter. And we look at him funny, but they, I often wonder, has this guy got it right? He came with a full measure of truth and grace. We have the cure. As a church, we have the cure. But we're so busy fighting among ourselves. You know, Jesus said the Great Commission, go into all the world. And I know there's tension around Halloween. And I know there's tension around Target. And I know there's tension around the, the NFL. And, and the, there's all this tension swirling. But see, Jesus never called us to become a holy huddle sitting in his building and hope somebody walks through our doors. He said, go into a dark world and be a light. I walked into Target the other day for the first It's mine. It's for, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I don't care where you shop. I walked in, in Target the other day and thought I was cheating on God. I was hoping none of y'all would see me. And then I'm like, why am I thinking that? Because that young lady cashier, God just put on my heart, does she know me? It's not about whether I buy some soap at Walmart or whatever it was, shoes, I don't remember what it was. It's about that young lady. It's about those people walking up and down the aisle. And God has put a burden on my heart over the past month. And the reason I, I try to do things that I do, the, the reason I wear jeans and drive obnoxious trucks and, and don't get called brother or reverend or pope or whatever it is, is because I'm the least of these. But my heart breaks for those who are far from God. And we need truth and we need grace. See, Jesus didn't say sit in your dirty diaper of sin either. He actually raise the standard we talked about it last week if you look at the opposite sex lustfully you commit adultery live to that one but jesus calls us to reach people and i believe our church i really believe this our church is at a tipping point right now where we're about to become a dynamic force in this community we're already getting kicked off of youtube at a steady clip Woohoo! I think I'm kidding. My last two messages got booted off, and I had to put them back on. They haven't got booted off again. I don't know. Maybe they have. I take that as a badge of honor, by the way. I've been booted off Facebook. I love it. 
When you start making a difference, the enemy's going to come at you with everything he's got. And I, I believe our church is about to be a, a huge force within the community. When I see us honoring veterans and I see us, you know, going to panhandles and, and I see us like, like what we do here on Sunday is such a small part of what we do for the commission that I go, man, we, we have an opportunity as a church to reach thousands within our community. We, we, we have the opportunity to have massive impact. And move forward as a church into our community. And see, truth and grace creates healthy tension. You gotta have, have systems and way to do it, or you have chaos, but you gotta have unconditional love. So when somebody walks in and they're dressed like we don't dress, and they got things hanging out that we don't want hanging out, it's easy for us to go, you need to, to go and put something on. But if we send them out, do they ever walk back in? I don't know. Truth and grace. When you, when you get into the, the ditches of lost and sin and shame, which we all live in, it gets messy. And so sometimes it gets messy and we have to make decisions. And, and there's cultural mess and there's sexual immorality mess and there's idol mess and there's, there, there's pride mess. And there's chairs versus pew mess. And there's paint on the wall mess. And there's kneeling benches mess. And I'm not calling anything out. I'm just saying there's mess and there's things that we need to, to pay attention, but the main thing needs to be the main thing. Who are you witness, witnessing to at church? Who are you witnessing to at work? Who are you witnessing to in your school, on the playground? Who have you walked up and said, did you know Jesus loves you? Truth and grace. And the church is... Is it so busy infighting, and, and I don't mean our church, but the church as a whole. And if you don't believe me, walk up to somebody and say, Church of the Highlands. You get a reaction. Well, they're just an inch deep and a mile wide, but you know what? They're reaching people for Jesus. Or, or say Baptist. Well, they're just a bunch of fundamental right wing, but they're reaching people for Jesus. Or Methodist. Well, they just, can you believe it? They're reaching people for Jesus. St. Mark and Sulphur Springs and Church of the Highlands. And, and as a church, we've got to get into a place in community where we're rowing with the same direction and we're battling the same enemy and we're not battling ourselves and we're reaching people in our community. There are thousands of people in our community of Northport and Tuscaloosa that are going to go to hell. And it makes me cry. It makes me cry. What are we doing as a church? Two of the things that within the church that, that will, will come at us from within. The first one is judgment. The first one is judgment. It says this, Matthew 7. Do not judge others, you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. <laughs> Let's think about that for a minute. Do we, my mom used to say this, something like this. Treat others as you want to be treated. I didn't realize that was actually biblical. I thought she was just telling me to quit being a jerk. But she would say, treat others. And, and what I realized is my mom was teaching me scripture in a way that wasn't beating it over my head. But think about that. Treat people the way you want them to treat you. So that day that I walked into a church, the reason I do things the way that I do is the, the day I walked into a church with all my tattoos and all my piercings and all my junk and all my mess, and all the drugs I did, and all the sex I had, and all the sins I committed. The day that I walked into church, that church said, we welcome you because you need Jesus, young man. And because of a, a Oki from Oklahoma named Kerry Martin, and because of a guy named Joe White who runs a Kennecook camp, I'd never been to Kennecook in my life. I wound up on my knees, slobbering mess. And I was forgiven. And then I walked in, into a church, and after I was forgiven, I was baptized. See, I was baptized when I was eight, but I felt like I'd walked so far away from God that it didn't stick or something. I don't know. But Joe baptized me in that dirty, nasty, slimy pond right in front of his house, and it was February, and it was cold. But you know what I remember? I remember that day that changed my life because Joe didn't judge me when I walked in. Joe said, hey, bud, did you know that there's a guy who died for you that loves you? And I said, Joe, I don't think. <laughs> you don't know, bro. He said, he loves you. I said, but I did. He goes, I don't even want to know what you did. He loves you. But you have no idea. He loves you. And I gave my, my life to Jesus. Right then and there. 
with all of my junk. And then I walked into a church, and that church didn't judge me. That church took me right where I was at and said, we're going to walk with you forward. We're not going to worry about where you've been. We're going to move forward with you. And they did. They did that. And because of that, I'm now a pastor, which is God's sense of humor. Truthfully. But I'm going to tell you, the reason that I wear weird clothes and say weird things and bring weird stage props is because I want to reach that cat who's far from God. I want those people who've been in church for 30 years who've become stagnant to get excited and passionate about God. And I don't care where you, your past is. I want to see where God's going to move you because he put you here for a purpose. Some of you are business owners with, with employees under you that can have massive impact for the kingdom. Some of you work in, at Goodrich and Mercedes and you've got, you've got a mission field like crazy. That you can walk up and just say, do you know how much Jesus loves you? You know how I know? Because he loved a guy like me. And if he can love a guy like me, good night he can love you. Truth and grace, and it's messy. It's messy. Do not judge, or you'll be judged in accordance with the way that, that you're judging people. Why well, worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you got a log in your own? Truth and grace is me calling you out and saying, Look, man, you're going down the wrong road, but knowing that I'm going down the wrong road too at any given time in my life. Like we do it. We're all sinners. We're all busted. We're all junk without Jesus Christ. But it says, Take the log out of your eye before you're worried about the speck. Let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye. And then it says hypocrite. First, get rid of the log. The other thing that will get us, and this is where I want to land today, is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgiveness will get inside of a church. Forgiveness will get inside of the church. Well, I left Walla Walla Baptist. I'm not going to actually use anybody here because y'all will think I'm preaching at you. I'm not. But I left Walla Walla Baptist because they offended me, and that pastor's a baraka. And I'm never going back to church there. And, and you walk away, and you got bitterness. Or, or you knew a Christian who hurt you, and you've never walked back into church. And can I tell you, that's like saying you, you ate a bad taco and got sick, so you're never going to eat again. And if you go to Taco Bell, you deserve it. Rabbit trail, I'm hungry. I'm looking at the clock. I know you are too. Here's the deal though. Is we live in bitterness and unforgiveness and that, 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 that can so get in the way of God's purpose for you and for me and for our church and for the church is we live in unforgiveness. And here's the deal. You don't have the right to be offended. I don't have a right to be offended. And I struggle with this because I get offended so easy. Somebody will text me, and I look at it, and I'm like, do they mean this or do they mean that? I use emojis as punctuation, by the way, because I sound like a jerk when I text, and I don't do it well. And I misspell a lot of things, and I have people be like, bro, what's your problem? I'm like, I don't know, but yeah, I agreed with you. So now I punctuate with emojis. I put a smiley face behind everything, almost. But we get so offended. But here's the we don't have the right to be offended. Because if there's anybody that has a right to be offended, it's Jesus Christ. Because we spit on him. And we beat him. And we nailed him to a cross. But he says, you know what? Even in that, I love you. I love you. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. This is in John 8, 2 through 11, if you're watching online. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Sexual sin. I, can't, I just want to I just picture this for a second. A bunch of religious people. We sitting in church, and some lady commits adultery out in our community, and we drag her in here and bring her up on stage. Can you imagine the shame in that? They made her stand before the group. They caught her in adultery. They hadn't heard about it. She was in the act of it, so they drug her. I was, I mean, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses, the law, commands us to stone her, to kill her. Now, what do you say? They were trying to trap them. Then they were using this question as a trap. See? 
in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stepped down and he wrote on the ground. I personally believe he was writing their biggest sin. At this, those who heard begin to go away one at a time. <laughs> That's why I think that. I want to tell you something. Jesus starts writing my biggest sin, I'm out. Because y'all ain't going to know it. Y'all ain't going to judge me by it. I suspect you don't want me knowing yours. They walked away one at a time. The older ones first, they had, they had more sin. Truth. Until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Grace, ultimate grace. They should have killed her. We should all die for our sins, right? Nobody's righteous, no, not one. All of us, black hearts of sin. All of us standing before God will, the Bible says, every knee will bow. You can, you can disclaim him on earth, but the Bible says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that you're Lord. You, you know, I, I envision it says Jesus wipes away every tear. I think the tears are because we realize when we look at Jesus' scars on his hands and we realize that we were so worried about things that didn't matter. That Jesus is actually going to grab us with those hands. And he's going to say, I love you. And that's going to be the tears. And then he's going to say, but you're in eternity now. <laughs> Grace beyond measure. And Jesus stood up and he asked the woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. And then he makes this statement, neither do I condemn you. If the Son of God, who died for us, does not condemn somebody for their sin, who are we to condemn another church? Who are we to condemn another Christian? Who are we to live in unforgiveness? People are going to let you down. You know how I know that? Because they're people. As your pastor, I'm going to let you down. You know why? Because I'm people. You're going to let somebody down because you're people. And we have to live in a place of grace that says, I don't have the right because I serve a God who sent his son. And then Jesus said this. So that's the grace. Everybody loves that part. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus, to declare. Now go and sin no more. Whew, that's a standard. He didn't say, hey, keep going, having a, uh, affairs. He said, go and don't ever do it again. He raises the standard of truth. And grace and church is messy and we have different thoughts than the church down the road and we have different thoughts than this church down the road. As long as they're bringing people to Jesus Christ, they're on our team. We have difference. Somebody sitting over here may have difference with somebody sitting over here. Can I tell you something? At some point, you're going to need forgiveness. Extend it. Jesus says love unconditionally. They will know you by how much you what? Not how much you attend, not how much you give, not how many fish you have on your car. Not what rope you have around your chain on your necklace. Not how many crosses you hang in your house. They'll know you by how much you love. As a church, we have to love. As a church, we, we need truth because there is truth. But man, we need to extend grace beyond measure. And I want to offer you that today. So I was trying to figure out stage because when I talk on forgiveness, it's hard because some of you, you, you have an ex-spouse you need to forgive. I hate that. Right? Because you don't know what they did to me, Pastor. I don't. Some of you have a, somebody who was supposed to protect you and they became a predator. Some of you have unforgiveness of somebody you can never face because they're six feet under. Some of you have a pastor who's jacked with you. Some of you have a have somebody in your life that has burned you beyond imagination. And you're living in bitterness and unforgiveness, or you're living in judgment of others. And I want to I want to offer you freedom today. Because as a church, to fight this battle, we've got to get past judgment and unforgiveness. We don't have a right to judge anybody. But more so than that, we don't have a right to live in unforgiveness. Because we've been forgiven. On our best day, our knee will bow and our sins will be broadcast in front of God, and we're going to ball like a baby. I want to offer you that freedom today. So I was trying to figure out what I could do, living in unforgiveness, and, and uh, I've done a bunch of these over the years, and, and this is the one that seems to, to, 
to get the most because I can't put it into words. Unforgiveness, you consume yourself. You consume yourself. You become bitter. Anybody ever know those bitter, bitter people you don't want to be around? It's because they have unforgiveness. And so what, what unforgiveness does is it consumes you. And it's like you take a gas can. I kept it away from the flame. Back up off me, security team. Can't get this thing open. So unforgiveness does this. You, you take a gas can, right? And you're mad and you're angry and you want to consume them. But often what it turns into is a consuming of you. And so you take this gas and, and, and you, you start to pour it on yourself, right? You start to pour it and it's all over you. Don't freak out, security team. It's all good. And then you pour it and it's all over you. And you're sitting in the stench of the unforgiveness that you have, right? It just keeps on. You keep on. Every time you see them, you just pour more on you. And every time you, you drop by that church, you're like, I hate you. And you just pour it and you pour it. And then, to prove them so wrong, you grab some matches. And you strike it. And it burns. And obviously, I did not pour real gas on there. <laughs> not stupid. I don't care how much I love you. Not doing that one. But it just burns, and it burns, and it burns, and it consumes, and it eats you up. And you become ineffective, and the enemy wins the battle. So today, I want to offer you two things. Worship team, go ahead and head up. I want to offer you a couple of things today. One, I want to offer you freedom in Christ. If you're sitting in here, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if, you're, if you wonder if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you went down an aisle because somebody gave you a great speech at the age of five and you wonder every day because you've lived a life that, that may be not Christian-esque, I want to offer you Jesus Christ this morning. I'm not doing my job unless I offer that every week. It's not a job for me. I want to spend eternity with you. Every knee will bow. I want to offer you that. You don't have to go through me. You don't have to go through an elder or a priest or a anything. It's between you and God, right where you're at. Just simply this. If you confess with your mouth, God, I'll choose you. I choose you. You sent your son for me. God, I choose you. If that's you today, just open your hand where you're at. It's just symbolic. You don't have to come to the front. You don't have to pray with me. You just talk to God because he sent his son for you. You just say, Jesus, today I choose you. Maybe you've been living a life that's so far removed from God. Maybe you know you were saved and, and you've lived this life and you feel this desire to, to, to say, God, today I choose you again. I choose to start living for you. I want today to be a defining point in my life where I say, I choose you. I know I'm not going to get it all right, but man, I'm going to try my best. But today I choose you. Right where you're at, you just open up your hand. If you're in here this morning and you have unforgiveness in your heart, parent, ex, friend, predator, abuser, church member, pastor, enemy, if you have unforgiveness in your life, I want you to open your hand this morning. And I want you to let it go. I want this to be the defining day. And you may have to do this every day for the rest of your life, but let it begin today where you say, I don't deserve the forgiveness I got. I'm going to give it. Unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness. It's hard to wrap your brain around because I don't know what they did to you. But I know this. I know what we've done to Jesus Christ. And He loved you enough to forgive you. He loved you enough to save you. He loved you enough to save a guy like me. And I want to offer you freedom this morning. Freedom in Christ. And only through Christ alone comes salvation and forgiveness. And if that's you this morning, I want to challenge you. I know this makes some of you nauseous to walk in front, but if there's somebody in your life that you need to forgive and you have a hard time, maybe they're sitting in this room, maybe they're sitting in a graveyard. I don't know. Bring it to the steps. Put it here probably can't do it on your own we're going to have people that are going to pray with you 
If you want it, we're going to have people that will leave you alone if it's between you and God as I bust my tail. But here's the truth, though. Salvation and forgiveness only come through Jesus Christ. Maybe you were five and you're confused. Let today be the day you're not confused anymore. I choose you. We're about to do a baptism. Here's the deal. You want to get dunked today? Come on. Tank's open. All baptism is is a symbolic gesture that says, I choose you. I raise my hands and say, you are good. Don't let any more confusion get in. We got a battle, guys. We got a battle every day for salvation and for forgiveness. Let today be that defining moment. I don't care if you get your makeup messed up. Come over. It's warm, too. But let today be the day. There'll be an elder over here if that's you. For those who are getting baptized, go ahead and head back. But if that's you, let today be the day. You don't have to go through me. You go through God. If you're watching online, let today be the day. Choose him in salvation. Choose him in forgiveness. God, this morning, I know I've gone long. But God, your message does not have a clock on it. There's somebody in this room today that needs to hear your voice. There's somebody in this room today that needs you. There's somebody in this room today that needs your unfailing forgiveness. Your unconditional love. God, there was a point in my life when I was on my knees, busted, and you took my hand. And I know if you can do it for a guy like me, there's not a sin in this room that you can't forgive. There's not a past in this room that you can't overcome. God, there's there's not a slight in this room that you can't help somebody walk in freedom of unforgiveness because you watched your son. God, forgive us. Forgive us. God, forgive us. God, reach into this room. Reach into our community. God, I pray for every church in this city. Because as long as there's people going to hell, we need every church in this city. I don't care about denominations. God, I care about you. God, as a church, allow us to walk in unity with other churches. As a church, let us allow us to reach people for you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name.